I too want to wish our moms a happy Mother's Day, and if we could bow in a word of prayer together as we begin. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for this special day that we can celebrate um, moms and all that they do for us. And we're thankful, Lord, for their impact on our lives. We're thankful, Lord, for the day-to-day. And we do pray, Lord, for um, the moms here, Lord, as they pursue you, pursue godliness, and uh, pursue ways that they can influence their children to follow you. And uh, we just ask your blessing upon them as we certainly show our appreciation for them today. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would have your blessing upon the service today as it continues and on this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, different cultures around the world uh, differ in their way on how they treat the elderly. Some good, some not so good. And let's, so what I want to do to kind of kick off things is take a trip around the world and discover how the world treats the older generation. First of all, you might be asking this question, who is considered old? In New Guinea, anyone who is over 50 is considered an old man or an old woman. And for this passage this morning, we'll actually see, as we talk about uh, widows later on, we'll see that the line is kind of drawn at 60. And actually, the United Nations would even attest to that as well. Now, Philadelphia Inquirer did a study on this. Do we want, really want to use the word old? And they did a survey, and they actually said, maybe we could replace that word with seasoned, or classic, or my personal favorite, chronologically gifted. <laughs> but when did the word old or elderly become a derogatory term. In many cultures, it's actually the opposite. In Greece, the old man term that is often used was actually a term of endearment and used often. In Korea, your 60th and your 70th 70th birthdays, you had huge feasts and parties for those. They celebrated those ages. In African culture, there's a term used in Kiswahili by those in younger generations in respect for others. And the Native American culture, according to the Huff Post, says that elderly are respected for their wisdom and life experiences. It's expected that that wisdom in the Native American culture is passed on to the younger generation. I found this interesting. In ancient Rome where the life expectancy was somewhere in the mid-twenties. Actually, half of children didn't even make it to the age of 10. So when someone reached the age of 60 in that culture, it was something. And they revered them, and they respected them. They wanted to hear about their life experience, and they wanted their wisdom to be passed down from generation to generation. There's also family care. In Japan and China, many of the elderly live with the adult family's children, or children's family. The adult children's family, there we go. And if not, they actually were required, are required to visit them on a regular basis. There is actually a law in China that they must visit their elderly parents on a regular basis. There's a similar law that was passed in France in 2007. So we know all around the world, all across the world, there are many generations living under one roof, and that is very common. You know what another place is where many generations are under one roof? The church. And inside the church, we are going to talk about and and we're going to discuss that we shouldn't just get along with each other in terms of generation to generation but how we are going to lovingly care for each other, especially the elder generation. God's Word speaks to it on how we are to treat the elderly, specifically the widows of the church. If we are going to call ourselves a church family, there is a proper way for us to treat each other as family from generation to generation to generation. And the three ways we're going to talk about today, three words I want you to remember 
are respectful, honorable, and diligent. So I'm just going to say the word and you're going to repeat it, okay? Respectful, respectful honorable, honorable, and diligent. And, diligent. and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning as we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So we'll begin with respectful, and if we could, I'll just read the first two verses as we begin here. It says this, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Here is the church family right here. There's older men, younger men, older women, younger women. The generations are, uh, the examples of generations are right here before us in verses 1 and verse 2. And you know, in, in churches all over the world and in America, we can see that it is pretty easy for us to draw lines among the generations, right? Whether it's programs or other things or just where we sit or how we treat each other and the church in general. And one big reason for that is because we are different. Let me give you an example of how we are different. How do you listen to music? Could it be on a record player? Could it be A tracks? I'll be honest, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Could it be a cassette tape? Could it be a CD? Could it be Spotify? I kind of know what that means. And we dress differently. <laughs> The, uh, at our senior night just this past Sunday, the, the theme of the night was dress like your parents. So they kind of poked fun at this, however, there's some differences there. And whether you maybe wear socks with your sandals, <laughs> or you always tuck in your shirt, or the way, how you wear your hat, it could be forwards or backwards or sideways. Even the way we dress is different from one generation to another. But the point of this passage is this, we're family. We as a church, the younger, the older, each generation, we are family. And we need each other. We need the wisdom of our elder generation. We need your example of, of pursuit of holiness and your perseverance of faith. Young people. We need your energy, your passion, your new ideas, your creativity. We balance each other between generations. That word respect is important. When we're talking about from one generation to another, I think culturally we're losing that a bit, aren't we? I think we need to teach our kids, and I'm not just trying to be old school here, but to say Mr. and Mrs., to say ma'am and sir. I want our kids' reaction to be when an older generation comes to them and has a conversation with them, that they would stop in their tracks and they would just listen. They wouldn't talk back. They wouldn't correct. They wouldn't quote-unquote educate. But they would listen and draw from the wisdom of older generations. And then vice versa, if, if you are a younger person and you're approaching someone that might be elderly or in an older generation, that you would approach them with respect. If there's an issue or you have a question or you need advice or you just need wisdom, you would just approach them with the utmost respect. See, in verses 1 and 2, we really see that together as a church, we are like family. You can kind of see that throughout 1 Timothy and, and how Paul is directing Timothy to, to guide his church into thinking, we're a family here. This is how we treat each other. You see it with the father and son's illustration that is often used between Paul and Timothy. I'm going to be straight with you here. We live in a community with a lot of absent fathers. Many young men are in our community, are living without an example of what biblical manhood looks like, what without biblical fatherhood looks like. So men, I encourage you to think about ways that you can invest in our younger men here in our church and our younger men here in our community. 
we're working towards, and you can pray about this, we don't have all the details of this, but we're working towards an event that we might have in the fall to address this very thing, to encourage our young men of our community and to give them an example of what maybe fatherhood and manhood looks like. Not that we have all the answers, but we want to encourage them and provide that for them. And then young men, as I said before, show respect, ask questions, give them the time of day, show patience, show kindness. I remember growing up, this is out of my notes here, so hopefully it goes well, but I remember going, growing up and um, was part of the men's golf league at a pretty young age. It's just a game I've always enjoyed playing. And part of the reason I enjoyed it so much was I could just, I was playing with adult men and I could just ask them questions about things that were going on in my life, about career questions, dating, marriage, all these things. I would just be, we'd be able to ask the questions and, and converse with each other. And it was just a benefit for me. So men, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be formal. That's a good thing too. But maybe just take them to the golf course. Maybe just have a milkshake with them. Maybe just walk alongside them. What are you interested in? Oh, I like to play golf too. That type of thing. And begin to have conversations that point towards Christ. And then mothers and daughters, appropriate for today... I will say this, without the older women of the church, I believe the pastor would not survive. They are a true blessing. And Timothy, who happened to be a young pastor as well, was exhorted to treat older women like he would treat his own mother. Romans 16, verse 13 says the very same thing as Paul describes how to treat the elder generation, to treat them like another mother. And I know there are many elder women in this church that help young men like myself and ask them, how are you doing? Ask us about our family. Try to encourage us. And treat us like a, a mother might treat their son, and it's a blessing. And I know many of you in this room could say the same thing. And I want to encourage you, the conversations that happen between generations of women be in this type of relationship where it's not just civil, where it's not just, how you doing? Are you having a good day? Okay, that there's questions happening, that there's life on life happening, that you're, that you're actually interested in what's going on in their life. Maybe the first time that a, that a young adult enters the workplace and they're not sure how to interact with this or they're a young mom or whatever it is, they have questions that we would... that. Elder women, the elder generation, would have loving and understanding and life-giving conversations with younger women. Then for our teens and kids, we see something here as well. We see that we are to that teens are to treat each other like brothers and sisters. You know, I've I've shared this story before, but it's worth repeating. I remember sitting before our our teen guys, whether in a small group setting or before we go on a mission trip and I and I told them listen these girls these teen young women they are your sisters in Christ and you are to make sure that you look at them appropriately and you make sure that when we're at events that other guys look at them appropriately and that you protect them that when we were in New York City, I, I told specifically a couple guys, and they know who they are, I said, one of you is going to be in the front, and one of you is going to be in the back, and the rest of you guys are going to be street side. That's how we handled things. We, we did the same thing in Germany. And it's not a sexist thing. It's because we're going to treat each other like you would treat your sister. You're going to protect her. You're going to respect her like you would your own sister. And listen... Boys, if you have sisters at home, and I understand they may drive you crazy, but here's the thing. <laughs> you better believe, and you know this, that your job still is, no matter what, to protect them. Keep an eye out for them. Show respect for them, and make sure everyone else is doing the same. And do so in all purity. So, we are family. And you see someone knock acting right what do you do in your family you take them aside privately and you address it carefully 
and sensitively, not proudly or harshly. You see someone that might be struggling. You do like family. You encourage them. You make them a meal. You write them a letter. I said it. I said you write them a letter. Yes. You encourage them. You need some advice. What do you do in your family? You ask someone who is older than you, someone who is wiser than you, and you do so respectfully and you find the answers. And you do all of these things with pure thoughts, pure motives, and pure words. We respect each other here. At Memorial Baptist Church, there is respect for each other. From our babies in the nursery who we give great care to, to our teens who we give guidance and wisdom, to our adults we treat each other like brothers and sisters, to the older generation we show respect and honor. We are one church. And we are not shy about wanting generations to be together, to serve together, to listen to each other, and worship together. We're not shy about that. We desire that. We want that. And we believe in 1 Timothy 5, it's talking about that, that even directions to the early church are directions to us, that we are to be one church from generation to generation to generation, that we are together, and we worship together, and we serve together. And then as we continue in our passage, we see verses 3 through 8, honorable, honorable in your actions or to give honor. Very first word, we see it there, verse 3, honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. But she who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things so well that so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied his faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Strong words. So we'll begin to talk together about that word honor. What does true honor look like? Well, it's not a new concept. It's something that was introduced in Mosaic laws, continued in the Psalms and prophets, into the Gospels, and now we're into the epistles where it's no stranger. It's no surprise that we find it here in the instructions for the early church that the care for widows and the honor that they so rightly deserve has always been at the forefront of God's instructions for His people. If you go to all the way back to Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 and 23, it has that connotation that if you mess with the bull, you get the horns kind of thing. God's saying, don't you dare mess with widows. Don't take advantage of them. Make sure you take care of them. Because if you don't, you have me to answer to. God was clear in His stance to defend the widow, to take care of the widow, and it's the same in our church. And verse 7 is clear and really it's saying, listen, you better tell your church this. You better make it clear your stance on honoring the widow. And let everyone hear it. Honor the widow. Everyone heard it. Now you're without excuse. Now you must do it. And then it speaks a couple times about what a true widow is. And more on later in this passage, it'll continue to talk about it. But a, a true widow in this passage is one who lives alone, who is reliant on others, who has little to no family to take care of her. See, the widows, first of all, as it so clearly states in Scripture, the widow's primary source of care should be from the family. I realize that many of you are experiencing this right now as we speak, as you are taking care of an elderly person in your family, possibly a mom who is a widow, whether inside your home, whether you're visiting a nursing facility, or possibly frequent visits to their home. You are honoring your parents, and many of those are, as we said, widows. May we 
as a church lift you up in prayer. And I want to do that right now if we could. I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you for this example that is before us of the many that are taking care of their elderly parents. We pray that you would give them perseverance. We pray you'd give them patience and grace. Lord, that they uh, would get the strength from you and rely on that strength. Thankful for the day the day. Thank you for their way of honoring their parents in this special way. And we just ask, Lord, you would lift them up. In Jesus' name, amen. The reason why I wanted to stop and pray for you all, because I know that the days can be long. I've spoken to you about them. The many phone calls you make, the prescriptions you pick up, the doctor visits you schedule, that is honor. You are showing honor to your parents. And everyone in this room will say this, that it reverberates more than you even know. You might think, no one ever sees this day-to-day, the the prescriptions we pick up, the doctor visits i got to take, the phone calls about all sorts of things and waiting on hold for hours. No one ever sees that. I want to say this, it's a testimony to everyone around you. And it is a way that you are following Christ and you are sharing His love as you honor your parents even when your love tank is on E. You see, in, in, in Greco-Roman culture, it was even more of a need for these widows to have the church to fall back on. Because there was no pension, there was no social security, there was no senior assistance during that time. And if you know how it worked in biblical times, it was the son, when the father died, the son received all of that inheritance. But if there was even no family around... There was no income for that widow at all. So the widow had full reliance upon who? The church. That was it. To survive. So even more so, as we study the Scripture here, we know why we see a true widow described as someone who prays every day and every night, like sweet Anna in Luke chapter 2. We see them praying. Because why? Because they had nothing else. They fully relied on the church to provide them with food and shelter and clothing. The very basic necessities the church had to come in and help. So when we talk about honoring the true widow, what an example it was in the early church because they wouldn't even survive. That word honor outside of honoring our Lord, because we see that often in Scripture. But that word honor outside of that is seen in probably a very famous place in Scripture. I'll give you a hint in the Ten Commandments. That's more than a hint, I know. It says in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother until they reach age 60, then you're free to go. (laughs) It doesn't say that. It says honor your father and mother There is no time limit. No age restriction. And this one might even be even harder. There is no behavior requirements for the parent. I've said this in counseling before. You are commanded to honor your parents. It's very hard for those in this room who have had cruel a cruel dad, a cruel mom in your life. And this passage is not asking you to enter that toxic relationship or put yourself in danger. That is not what this is saying, but it is saying to honor your father and mother. And I know there are those that are in this room and those that are listening in the gym and online. That is a tough ask. I understand that. But there is no fine print here. It says to honor your parents. Honor your father and mother. And the same idea with widows. We are to honor the widows of our church. And may I say this? I love how Warren Wiersbe says it and points it out. He says, godly widows are spiritual powerhouses in the church. Spiritual powerhouses in the church. And I fully agree. 
because their prayer and their encouragement and their example and their decades of teaching Sunday school and children's church and Awana and their ministry and nursery and alongside other women of the church and, work, and serving in the kitchen and all the things that they've done and made meals. You know, someone comes to your mind probably when you think of that godly widow in our church, specifically in our church. Someone who's with the Lord right now or someone who is currently in our church body right now. They have blessed you beyond belief. And you have fond memories of them or they are currently touching your heart with their godliness and kindness and care. We are to honor the widows in our church. And I want to honor you right now on all that you have done for our church. It's a blessing. And continues to be. And then the true believer is mentioned. You know, this true believer is talking, and we'll talk about it in a second, but this true believer is talking about those widows that were uh, really taking advantage of their widowness, and, and many of them were abandoning their faith, abandoning God, and pursuing things that they should not. The lesson here is, as it continues even, str even stronger in verse 8, talks about what true believer does in terms of their family. They do not abandon their family. I did research about this in the animal kingdom. Even elephants and whales don't abandon their elder generation. So if elephants and whales are doing this, even more so humankind should be doing this, even more so believers those that have been saved by grace should be doing this. And we should be taking care of our family. It's what family does. We should be honoring our widows and doing so even more than what is culturally normal. May we continue to grow in our care for our widows. We take care of our widows and we know we need growth in that. And I'd ask that you'd pray for that. If you are a study of our budget, you see that there is a budgeted item in there to take care of our widows. We are to honor them. And then there is a true cause. Kent Hughes raises a profound cultural point here. He says, there are those that may not be widows in our church community, but are still abandoned. I'm thinking of those single godly mothers that are doing their very best. And I know there's growth that needs to happen here, but the church needs to honor them and support them and provide resources for them and their family. See, widows and single godly mothers, this is what we would call a true cause of a church, right? Of our church. That we would take care of them and we would honor them so I, I ask you this question, if you're taking notes, maybe something that strikes a chord with you. Maybe God is already impressing on your heart and an answer this, to this question is, will you commit today to seeking out ways to honor the widow? They may need a meal. They may need their lawn cut. They may need simply someone to sit next to them on their porch on a Friday morning. Who will it be if it not be the church? Will you pray for them? And this is an even harder prayer. Will you pray for them? And will you pray what you can do for them? And then, when God impresses it on your heart, you do it. Honoring the widow. And then, moving in verses 9 through 16, we see similar expectations, really, of the widow... As we saw earlier, as we've studied through 1 Timothy, we saw expectations of the overseer, the deacon, the deacon wife. And now we look at kind of expectations of what a godly widow looks like. Let's read 9 through 16, 1 Timothy 5. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll younger widows, 
For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and to incur condemnations for having abandoned their former faith. And being that, they learn to be idlers going from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying they should what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her, her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so it, is, it may care for those who are truly widows. First of all, it's not saying in this passage that we should never care for someone who is a younger widow. That's not what it's saying. The issue here was this. There was those that were younger widows, and they were taking advantage of the church. They had the resources. They had the ability. They had family around them that was taking care of them, and they were drawing resources from the church. Not only that, but they were pursuing unbelieving men, and they were deciding to fall into sin and follow after these men, and then trying to draw resources from the church all while doing that. So let me be clear that we still are taking care of our single mothers and those that have uh, lost. But I want to say this, that the godly widow is someone that is described here. She is one who continues in her godliness and her spiritual growth, no matter her age and her difficulty of this situation she's in as a widow. She continues with her testimony and her example prior to this life stage she's currently in. And a few requirements were given here for a godly widow. One, it talks about age. It puts a number on it. It talks about being 60 years old. Again, age is not something that we need to be ashamed of here. It's something that we need to actually revere and respect. So if we could change that cultural narrative from our elder generation all the way down to our younger generation, that there is respect from one to another. And then it talks about family. It talks about family. It talks about being faithful to her husband. She was a woman that was faithful. She was a woman that raised her children well. And then it talks about testimony. It talks about the testimony of a widow. She has a reputation. That reputation is that she has done good works for others. And then service. She opens up her home. She serves others in her church and community. She cares for those that are hurt and struggling. She is one that would be described as devoted. She can be counted upon with a humble and willing spirit. And then the opposite we see. So we saw the true godly widow. It really is an example for uh, the elder generation of what a woman in the faith should look like. And then we see kind of the opposite here. And I would call, describe them as dilatory. Young widows described here really, as I said, were causing issues in the church. They were using their widowness as a free ride to be idle, to be lazy, to just gain money and resources for the church and not do anything. It was enablement for them for more sin. Not only were they grabbing money from the church, they were also taking it and going out and doing things they were not supposed to do. I want to take this 11 through 15 in our passage this morning and take this as a blueprint for our young women of the church. Some of it is what not to do. Some of it draws what we sh you should be doing. So young women, this is for you. The first thing I want to discuss is passion. Being passionate. Many young women during this d stage in life, and specifically in this passage, were allowing unbelieving, their desire for unbelieving men to overpower their desire for Christ and godliness. I'm not trying to Jesus juke you here, but I will say this. The primary love of a godly young woman should be Jesus. So that means if your desire for a young man or your current relationship with a young man drains your passion for Jesus Christ, you are playing with fire. 
and you need to turn the other way. And I've had young women, in our discussions in teen group, young women might ask this question, well, what if I never find that godly man? What happens if there's none out there? I want to say this to you. It is, if it is God's will for you to marry, you bring your passions to the cause of Christ. And then if it is God's will for you to marry, that godly man will meet you there. You do not settle down here. You continue to grow in your spiritual growth. You continue to follow Christ. You continue to allow your life to be an example to those around you. And you continue to go towards Christ. And that godly man will then meet you there. You don't stop here and let him wait for you or wait for him and settle. And I know that's hard to do. The second thing, the second instruction I have for you is to be true to faith. The young women in this passage were abandoning their faith. They were just giving it up. They were choosing paths that would feed their selfish desires. They were not being selfless. They were not following Christ in the church. So young women, I encourage you to stay true to your faith. Even in the ups and downs, even in the difficulties that you will face, stay true to the faith. And then third, get moving. Get busy doing what God wants you to do right now. Like, young ladies, what are you waiting for? Some of you might be just waiting for God to write His will in the clouds for you. It's not going to happen. You are so worried about your future and what's going to happen, you forget what's happening right in front of you. Find ways to serve in the church. Be a mentor to someone that is younger than you. Allow your experiences now to make you stronger for the future. This may sound like a scolding. It's not. This is to encourage you in your faith. And then, as it talks about here, it is to avoid gossip. You are not to care more about the social media than sola deo gloria. So many of your conversations do not need to start with, hey, did you hear? They should start with, hey, can I help? And encourages you very specifically in this passage. These women were saying things they should not say. So I encourage you, young women, careful what you say. Even more so now than ever and how your words will stick. Whether you type them or you send them or you say them, what you say, how you say it, and who you say it to, and the timing of how, when you say it, all matters. And be careful in what you say. And then we have, at the very end of our passage, we find a nugget of truth for our moms. And two things are listed here as requirements for you as moms. The first is to manage the household. And as it talks about, talked about it with our deacons and deacon wives, it does not ask for perfection here. It simply says to manage your household. So when someone asks you, how, moms, when someone asks you, how are you doing, you can say, I manage. And that's biblical. Will you sometimes lose it? Will you sometimes eat an entire carton of Ben and Jerry's ice cream in the closet? Will you take a stroll in Target when you have nothing to buy? You just want some peace and quiet. Absolutely, that will happen. But you're managing. How do you manage? Verses 9 and 10. It gives us the instruction here. How do you manage as a mom? Number one... You stay faithful to your husband and to your kids. Faithfulness. Number two, testimony. You keep your testimony and your words and your action, and you keep your testimony by protecting what comes in your home. On the TV, on what friends might be saying, on what culture is doing, you, don't, you have conversations about it. You don't completely shelter your kids, but you have conversations, but you do protect them. 
from what they watch, what they interact with. And then third, you serve. You serve outside of yourself. You think of others. You look around this room and you invite someone today to coffee this week and you pray with them. You stop and you ask them, ask someone in the hallway today, how is your week going? How are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? And take time to listen. And then fourth, the greatest of all is gospel. You stay devoted to the greatest cause of all. Through all this, as a mom, you are devoted to the greatest story of all, the gospel. Listen, you may have syrup on your shirt from this morning. You may have a preschooler in children's church right now that has two left shoes. But if you stick to this list, you'll manage. You'll manage to be a mom that gives God glory and leads others to Christ, including your children. And that is what it's all about. Husbands, you know that your wives, moms, can do what you cannot do. That's why this maybe should be called Mother Appreciation Day and not Mother's Day. And you are not even designed to do it for that matter. But may we pray as fathers, may we support moms and encourage them as they seek to manage the home alongside us. Second instruction, fight. <laughs> well, let me finish that phrase. Fight the enemy with good. Don't give Satan an inch in your life, moms. Don't desire that which is not yours, whether it's a house, whether it's another husband, whether it's an income. Just don't go there. Don't give Satan even a millimeter in your life and what you envy. Don't get caught up in gossip. Don't get caught up in the he said, she said. Get caught up in what God said. And then fight fire with fire. Make time in God's word a priority. Pray. 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 Get involved in women's ministry here. We have an event tomorrow night that you can be involved in and will continue throughout the year. Serve the body in many ways that, that God has designed you to do. So moms, happy Mother's Day. And my two words for you today are manage and fight. You know, on a, on a sports team, each individual has a number on their back. You know, some are more famous than others, right? Number 23... Michael Jordan or LeBron James, Jackie Robinson, 42, Wayne Gretzky, 99. In the end, though, it's not the number that matters. It's the uniform that you play for in reality that matters. Each position, Michael, Robinson, Michael Jordan, Jackie Robinson, Wayne Gretzky, all of them had a position to play. They were playing for a team. Their goal was to help the team to play to the best of their ability, working for that common goal together. Whether they had double zero on the back of their uniform, all the way to 99, they were working together. So today, if we put, I'm not going to ask you to do this. Today, if we put our age on the back of our shirts, <laughs> ranging from 1 to 99, in the end, the number is not what matters. Absolutely, there's, an, there's instruction, there's wisdom between generation and generation, how we treat each other. I understand that, but here's the thing that I want us to remember. It's the team that we are playing for. We are all on the same team. We are family from one generation to the other. The younger and the older. The married and the singles. The widows and the widowers. We all are together. We all are on the same team. We all are family working for a common goal to invite others to know and follow Christ.
together. Let's pray. Father, Lord, there's, this is such a rich passage, instructions for all of us. And we pray, Lord, that we would follow what you say. Lord, that we would truly care for the widows of this church. Lord, that you would not allow the enemy to draw a divide between generations. But Lord, that we would truly be together that we would worship together, that we would serve together, that we would love each other, that we would care for each other, that we would listen to each other, that we would respect and honor each other. And Lord, we are, again, thankful for moms. We're thankful for the women of this church that serve so faithfully. We're thankful for the impact that they have, not only on our church, but our, on our community. We pray that you continue to bless them. We pray, Lord, that as they pursue godliness, that you would help them in that pursuit. And Father, we're thankful for our church, that you would protect us from the enemy, that we would continue and grow in being a light to this, to our community, that we would truly act as one church from generation to generation. In Jesus' name, amen.